Ok. Um. So now we have our uh, web page in HTML with the structure that we wanted. Uh, so let me say one thing about tables. Tables are to be used for representing tabular data, not for layout. So if you want to just put things in different columns, in a layout of the page, don't use tables. Tables must be used for content that could be tabular, like this, in this case, not for putting a title on the left and the content on the right. There are other ways for layout. So this is HTML. So if you need to write HTML, is more or less what we did with just maybe different tags, etc. Um, now, let's add a little bit of style, hmm? in addition to the style that the browser provided. So how we add style? So first of all, we need to create a file that's called style.css, for instance. And we need to import it. So in the head, we are going to write link what we want to link href style.css and the uh, the relation that uh, this file has with us and this is style sheet so we are saying to HTML to import, to use the instruction presented in this style.css. So you can define style inline, meaning that we can go here and say h1 style equal color red. We can do something like this. This is called inline style because we are applying the style to a specific element only inline because it's mixed with the HTML. And you can see that the attribute is called style and then this is a CSS instruction. When there is a property we want to change, color is a property and the new value of the property, red. So if we change style inline we see that the title becomes red, because we said that. Hmm? So this is possible, it's called inline style, but you don't have to do it, almost never. Hmm? So style, it's better to keep HTML file clean for the structure and the semantic information and all the style information go in a separate CSS file. For a lot of reasons, including readability, including maintainability, including reusing the same information all over. Because if we want to apply the same color to a different element, we will need to copy and paste this multiple times in the page. And if we need to change the color, we need to look in the page where this color is. And also, this is not a semantic information. So while this is possible to do, it's called inline style, this should be avoided. So if you want to add a specific style to, let's say, either one or other elements. So let's say that the sidebar, we want to give a background color to the sidebar that in this moment we, we don't have. And we want to say that the same color is also for the footer, for instance. We can uh, define an instruction in which we need to, select, to specify which is the selector. Hmm? So in CSS it's called selector. So the elements that will be selected for being applied the, um, the change of background color. So we want to select the aside. So we can write aside. And then we can say that the background color is, is I don't know, um,
Ellis blue. That's a sort of blue. Hmm? So this is an instruction that say that to all the aside element we have in the page, we have just one, but if we have two of them, to all the aside elements, it will apply a background color. That is this specific background color. Hmm? So if we save and refresh this, you see that the aside, as now, you don't see, but there is. Let me change the color. Let's put blue. Okay, now you see that the side has a bad background color, but at least it's visible. And maybe we can say also that the, the color of the text that is just color is white. So that it's at least readable. Hmm? So, and this is applied to all the side that we'll have in the page that links this CSS. And you see how CSS works. You have a selector, again, in this case, a side, and then you have instructions. I want the background color to a specific color. I want the color of the text a specific color. I want the font size a specific dimension, etc. You can combine multiple, uh, you can apply the same instruction to multiple elements. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we can say that this applies to the side or end to the footer. Mm -hmm. So, in this case, all the sides and all the footers that we have will have this uh, instruction. Uh, and again, this is still part of the review of the readings. Mm -hmm. So, this should be nothing really new if you read those documents. And, and then we have other two ways, two big ways, um, to define how things should look. For instance, if we want to make the questions, just the question, uh, in another style, let's say in another color, just the questions, we cannot write P like we did for a side, uh, color um, dim gray because if you do this we put all the P in this color so if we want just to have the questions is JavaScript better than Python just that question we cannot use this as a selector we need to select something more strictly than not all the paragraph in the page what can we do? We can name paragraphs, so we can access them directly uh, using their names. What is the name of the paragraph? Um, ID or class. ID or class. ID or class. Hmm? So we can add, <coughs> specify that this P, this paragraph, as a new attribute that, let's say that is a class, that is a class that is called question. Hmm? All, the, uh, all the tag, all the elements as the class and the ID attributes. Hmm? So we can say that there is a class that is called questions and then uh, we can have, for instance, an ID, hmm, I don't know where, we can put an ID maybe for in the table. We can put an ID here and we can call it a bigger margin. So these are just names that we put in HTML. We are saying that the question is a, as a class now that's called questions and the table as an identifier that's called the bigger margin. So now if we want to uh, change the color of the question, we can write dot question, dot identify a class. So if we um, save and refresh, you see that only the question now has the color that is different and not the other paragraph because we selected just a class. 
and if we want to do something for the ID we instead should write bigger hmm, margin and we can say that the margin top of the table is 1 yam on one rem hmm? and if we refresh bigger margin we should see the margin changed It's too small in this case. Okay, let's say 3 EM. To see a difference, because probably the default margin was already in that, in that, in that size, so we see that we have a bigger margin on the top of the table. So when to use classes and when to use ID? How many IDs should be in a HTML page? So the number of little is small, it's not a number. How many identifier, unique identifier? It's called ID because it's a unique identifier. How many unique identifier how many times we can use bigger margin in the HTML page? Once, because it's a unique identifier. So how many unique identifier called bigger margin you can have in a page? One, because otherwise it's not unique. So when you target an ID, that ID should be present only one in that page. So you can have multiple IDs, but they should have different names. How many Classes, how many elements co co with a class question you may have in the page? How much do you like? Hmm? So the main difference is that classes, you can use the same class, apply the same class multiple times. The ID should be applied just one. So it's one exception. So in this case, we want a bigger margin only in one place. That exact instruction. If we want a bigger margin in more place, we can convert it in a class and use it. Okay, um, what is a 3 EM? Any idea? It's a dimension, right? Because we, we change it and the margin becomes bigger and smaller. No, more or less. So, uh, CSS supports multiple units. The default one that all of you think about is the pixel. That is an absolute unit because it's fixed. It's always 10 pixels, always 10 pixels. Doesn't matter how big or small the screen is. So if you are in a small screen, then pixel can have, 10 pixels can have a significant change on the page. If you are in a 4K screen, 10 pixel is really, really a small change. So CSS has relative units as well, relative to something. Hmm? So the most common, these are the uh, six, five uh, relative units. The most common are actually the first two, EM and REM. Hmm? Uh, when possible, use relative units instead of pixels because they are easier to scale, to change between computers, displays, etc. Uh, EM is a unit that sets the size relative to the font size of the element. So if the font size of the element is 12 pixel, 2 EM will be 24 pixel. If it's 10, 20. is relative to the font size set for the current element. Hmm? So either you set a font size for the element and then everything else is relative to that font size or the browser set the default font size for the element. 
uh, that means that in an element 2 a.m. can have a different behavior than in another element because it depends on the font size set for that element. Uh, it's preferable nowadays to use R EM that is relative to the font size to the root element. So to the font size assigned to the HTML tag, basically. So the root element, the root tag. So that is more stable because in one page you will have just one font size for the only HTML elements you have. So all of that will be in proportion to that. Then you have other three units. Uh, two are related to the viewport. So the size of the browser window. One is VW and the other one is VH. VW is relative to 1% of the width of the viewport and the age same things for the height of the viewport so you can say I want my element to be 10% of my viewport and if my viewport change because I resize the window that things change as well and same things for VH but it's on the height of the viewport so if I resize on the other side uh, the percentage instead is relative to the parent element. So if the parent element is 50 pixels, 50% 50 is 25. Mm -hmm. Just percentage. So when possible, prefer relative units um, because they are more scalable, more responsive on different screens, on different devices. And REM is nowadays preferred. Um, we, we have covered a little bit. So you either had in the readings this material or you... Uh, we have covered it um, just briefly we have said that just as a selector we have seen the element selector for aside and for the footer we have seen the class selector the id selector but there is also the attribute selector in which we can say that is written that way with name and val is the name of the attribute Wh where we can say everything that has the attribute href set to http polito.it will have this style so we don't care if it's a class an id if it's a p a link or whatever but everything that well not a p because it doesn't have an uh, href but uh, everything that has an href it could be a link it could be an a it could be something that has that attribute specific attribute then will get this style so there are various ways to select things. We have seen the element selector, the class selector, the ID selector. The attribute selector can be varied. You can say I want just to all the elements with that attribute or with all the elements with that specific attribute, with a specific value of the attribute, or that elements that contain a subset of that value in that attribute, etc. All the combination you can probably imagine, including starting with, ending with, etc you also have pseudo class selector so uh, a link has various states the link is visited the link is not visited yet the link is active the link has the mouse over and all of these are can be styled hmm? so you can say that all the links that are not visited are blue first one a column link uh, the visited one the one you clicked on can change color uh, if you over the mouse over you can change color etc these are pseudo class selector so they are about a specific element and some state of that element so the links have those uh, also the table the table row as over when you move the mouse over and the input as the state that is focused or not focused when you click on the on the input and there is the cursor blinking on the input that is focused you have the focus on the on the elements and so you can change the behavior you can change the style when it's there is a focus and we you can combine selector we have seen a side comma um, footer that is applied to both but you can also say if one element is nested within the other or if it's a child or if it's come after or if it's come later than etc so you can say i want all the p's that are inside uh, a side or all the paragraphs that are inside the main or 
all the table that came after the P. Mm? So you can select things also in this way if you want, if you don't need to target something specifically. And here again, there is um, a lot of things and we already mentioned display or we, we didn't mention that uh, in addition to display block and display in line, you can also um, hide elements from the page. So you have the elements in the HTML, but it's not displayed at all with display none. And you can also have visibility hidden. That means that the element is still on the page. It still occupies the space that the element has, but just not visible. So there is a blank space instead of the element. Instead, of display none just remove the element from the visibility of the page. So you don't have even the space occupied by the element. And uh, we have seen that there is a browser default style, and we have an external style, and then, then we have the uh, inline style. Um, CSS stands for cas cascading style sheet, because cascading means that one page can include more than one style sheet in these orders. Mm -hmm. So the, actually, our HTML page has Use, it, use it, both the external style, that one that we create in the style CSS, and the browser default style, that is the one provided by the browser. And when we define the external style, we overwrite the browser default style if they define those things for us. Okay? So if the browser default style define a margin for the table, and we say that the margin is 3 a.m., we are overwriting the default browser style. And we are overwriting this order. So the inline style, the one that you shouldn't use, is overwriting basically everything. The internal style, that is another thing not to use, but is a style tag within the head, directly within the head of the page, is overriding the external style. And the external style is overriding the browser default. The in that order. Uh, well, well, how to link, it's here, uh, and here there are the three examples, etc. Um, we also covered the, the box model before, content, padding, border, and margin. Uh, well, clearly, the entire size of the elements is made by, so the entire width of an element is made by the width of all these elements. So the width of the content, plus the width of the padding, plus the width of the margin plus the width of the border. And same things for the high. So if you want to know how much an element is occupying, you have to do the calculation we including and not only the content, but also the padding, the border, and the margin. And the box model and the display line blocks are basic concept. Uh, over the year, they added other layout approaches for the layout of the page, because right now we didn't have any layout of the page. We just put colors, right? We didn't lay out. We didn't say that the sidebar is a sidebar, it should be on the left, for instance, or on the right. We just set up things. Hmm? So over the year, they uh, set up different way to uh, have page layout, starting for float, passing to grid, and going to flex, where flex is the easiest to use and float is the hardest to use. Um, so, two words about the grids. Grids, as, because we are going to, use, to see flex a little bit better. Grids, as the name say, set up the page as a grid. Hmm? So you can say this element should go in the first cell, 0, 0, top left. And then this other element should go in the cell 3, 3. Hmm? So third line, third column. So you set up with a grid, with grid, CSS set up the page as a big grid with how many columns and row that you define. And you can say, okay, this element is going this portion of the grid and this other element is going this other portion of the grid in this other cell of the grid. And you reason about cells. You define cells, rows and columns, and you define where these things should go. Uh, not, not a lot flexible, because once you select a column, once you select a cell, you are there. But still better than uh, 
the float, for instance. And it's still common for many web page, web application that typically have a column somewhere and then the main content somewhere else. Mm? So it's easy to structure that as a grid. Uh, they are structured as a grid, and in this case, it can be also implemented as a grid in CSS. Um, but before going to, to C Flex, um, let me just say that there are three, four uh, position scheme. Um, so how the elements are positioned in the page. Mm? So up to now, we have used the static position, the normal flow. Each block element occupy all the space and, the, and then new line, new block element. Each inline element occupy just the space that it needs. If you want, you can also specify a relative position scheme. So an offset relative to the normal uh, position. So if a block should stay in the coordinate 0, 0, 0 pixel, 0, 0, so in the, in the top corner of the windows, you can say, okay, I want it 20 pixel on the bottom and 20 pixel on the right. You can move it relatively to that position. To the position of the page or to the position of the elements that contains this element to change the position. Hmm? So you have a list of three elements and you want to change the position of the second one, just relative to the other, to the main container. And then there is an absolute position that is absolutely positioned in the space that you have in the containing block. It will always be fixed there in an absolute position. And then there is the fixed, that is instead fixed, so absolute in a way, but fixed with re respect to some reference point, typically the viewport. So it's fixed in a position of page. And if you scroll, you lose that element because it go out of the viewport, for instance. So it's fixed on a page, like passing it on the page and whatever you change that is blocked there. Hmm? It's not relative to other things, so that you move things that still remain relative or absolute to the containing block is just fixed there. Hmm? It forever fixed there. Hmm? So these are three position scheme independently from the layout. And <coughs> nobody cares about this anymore. And so these are floating grids. And currently, uh, for the structuring page, what is used is this uh, flexbox that is another display style. So you have display block, display in line, display none, display grid, and you also have display flex that gives complete control over the alignment, direction, order of elements in a page. And it defines that its elements, its items, could be, for instance, aligned on the left or on the right. And they will automatically align in that position. Or that they will be, have a horizontal direction, so when you add items, it will be added horizontally, or a vertical direction. And then can be spread on the page, centered on the page, with small distance, with big distance, one of the other, etc. And you can also have size. They will need to occupy all the same space in the page. Or the first one will need to occupy double the space of the others. And this will be automatically handled by this display mode that is flex. Again, it's for layout. So all of these should be an element in a page, like you know, here, this should be the header, this should be the main content with paragraph, there is an image. Here could be other small buttons or image, and this could be the footer, for instance. And so this is for setting out the layout of the entire page. In bars format with flexibility. And flex defines two uh, type of elements. One are the container that should be, can be flex. It could be all the page flex, it could be just one container. It could be um, up to you. You can decide which elements could be flex and which not. And within the container, the elements within the container are called items. Hmm? And every 
HTML elements that is a direct child, a direct child of a flex container is a flex item automatically. Mm? So if you define a container as flex, all the direct child will be flex items. So we'll follow the rules and we'll have the properties of the flex uh, layout. Only the direct child. Mm? The second child, within, the child within a child will revert to the normal display block display um, in line according to the type of the element or display table in case of the table so if you turn a container in a flex container you just need to write a display flex in a, a in css then you can define some properties for for instance justify horizontally the elements so you can say all the elements should be on the left or centered or on the end of the page. And you can also say all the elements should have the same space around them. So let's say 15 pixel before and within each element, or they should have the same space between them and you don't care about the external space. And this is done automatically. As soon as you resize the page, as soon as you change the resolution, this will follow. And these are just attributes like justify content center and that will be put in this way or um, justify content space between and that will be uh, in this other format uh, you can also have wrapping with flex wrap that mean without wrapping if you add five elements in a page that show three the other three will be the other two will be out of the page you can wrap them so according to the size of the page they will just go uh, in a new line and follow. Mm? And also this is flex wrap wrap. Mm? Just a property that will, mm, instead of going outside of the page, will create a new line and follow the same rules that you define before for flex. Um, same things for vertical alignment. Mm? Uh, so you can align um, vertically and also in addition to horizontally things. Justify content will arrive, uh, will put things uh, horizontally. Align items will define it vertically in the page and has the same property and start and center like justify content. And you can also define a direction by default. The direction is row, that is the horizontal direction, that is the normal direction for blocks and inline elements. But you can also have columns if you want to structure things vertically. And the same property as before apply, just inverted. So the um, justify content in the, in the column direction will not work horizontally, but vertically, and the line item will work not vertically, but horizontally. But these are all properties in CSS, like this one. And then the page will behave in this, in this way. Uh, flex was born because it was, it's terrible, still terrible without Flex, to set things centered in the page, vertically, horizontally. Things that are not text, blocks that are not text, perfectly cent centered in the page. So Flex helps it with that, for instance. Um, direction, flexible item, as I said before, you can say that block occupies the elements that, the space that it wants, or they should have the same dimension or you can have the third element that is twice the others, for instance. So you can define that if you need it. And here there is an example in which the, all the elements has flex one and one single element is flex two. And since two is double than one, that will be resize all the elements accordingly, hmm? occupying the space needed. And it's just CSS. Uh, you can also group elements and apply uh, with div and apply uh, elements together. So you want one element on the left and two elements on the right, just group the elements on the right because flex is applied to the direct child. Mm -hmm. So if the direct child is div, that will apply that element. And here there is a few references, including a game with frogs, if you want to, to have the, the games with frogs. And just a mention of responsive design. Um, so what is a responsive design? What is a responsive? Yes. Uh, adapting the size uh, independently of the platform 
Exactly, adapting the content of a page according to the screen resolution that you have. So if you have on a desktop, you maybe have uh, all the elements as you define. But if you are on mobile phone, you maybe need to stack the elements one behind the other because you cannot have, you don't have a lot of space horizontally. So you need to use differently the space vertically. So responsive design is a set of queries, a set of properties of CSS, of standard CSS, to allow this transition between different resolutions. And this transition is done through an element, through one property is called media queries, that are written that way, uh, at media, and then you can specify the minimum width of the screen, and then the property that should apply, the, the selector and the property that should apply to that specific medium. So you can say that the paragraphs are black in uh, the desktop side, but as soon as you arrive at a certain resolution, then they should become in another color mm -hmm. or change layout or from block become flex, change properties of CSS. Mm -hmm. And these are called the media queries. So they are conditionally applying CSS rule, conditionally to the screen size, typically the width of the screen size. Because if you have something like this on the, on the desktop, you typically on the, on the mobile, you have something like this. So this feature becomes here after sign up because there is no space here to put three features in a row. You don't have enough screen size. So you can restructure the page without changing the HTML, without changing anything in the style sheet, just applying some conditional rules that say when the resolution is smaller, then these blocks should behave in this other way, should apply these styles. And um, we are not going to write CSS by hand, we're not going to write the layout of CSS by hand. Uh, we will do something like we did for the style, just adding some elements, the margin, etc. if we want to personalize some things. But what we are going to do and what the developer world is doing is using some CSS framework to apply all the styles. And in this course, we chose one of the uh, CSS framework available that is Bootstrap, um, that was originally created by Twitter um, and still developed by them. Um, and it will be also compatible with React. There will be also the React version of Bootstrap, so we can, we can use it. And we choose Bootstrap because um, on one side, it has a simplified layout models, and on the other side, so it, it gives us various components to be used, and on the other side, it will still allow us to edit CSS if we want. And there are other CSS, CSS framework, maybe more complex and more powerful than this, but they will hide the CSS. Instead, here, we can edit the CSS, we can overwrite the CSS like we did, like if we create the entire CSS the bootstrap framework and download it and write it in a CSS file on our computer. So we can overwrite those things easily. And so let's have a look at bootstrap. So bootstrap has a website that is getbootstrap.com. And we are going to use version 5.2.x, not the latest one, not version 5.3, it should, shouldn't really change a lot between 5.3 and 5.2, but we're going to use 5.2 because the React library for Bootstrap is using Bootstrap 5.2. So we get familiarity with the same version of the library we're going to use. And you will have the lab to experiment with Bootstrap mainly. We will do something in this half an hour. We will start at least changing our application to use Bootstrap, and then I, I can complete it and give it to you. Uh, Bootstrap is mainly to understand what they want you to do and do it in the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's really, especially at the beginning, looking at the documentation and see what you need and how to apply it with basically copy and paste, really. So if you want, and then as more you, you, you start to understand, uh, the more you, uh, you, you understand how to behave. So if you want, for instance, a navbar, 
Hmm? So bootstrap has a navbar hmm? that you can personalize, you can remove elements. And how this navbar is made? This is the code. So if you want a navbar, the first things to do after applying bootstrap is copying this code, put it in your um, web page, and instead of writing navbar, put the name of your um, application, your application, instead of home, well, probably you have home, instead of link, you will be uh, about or my movies in the lab. And maybe you don't need to search, so you can remove it. But in the bootstrap documentation, all the examples are with code be below. And so you can see what it's doing and try to understand what it's doing. And then is HTML, mostly div based and mostly applying classes. So this is a specific class that is nav link and all things in the navbar as a nav link if there are links. And this is something you understand by reading the code. And, and mostly is applying their structure, their semantic, their reasoning to your code to make things look uh, like this. And for instance, they also have buttons and they define colors for the buttons. So instead of the default buttons, you can have the primary color in which is a class. It's class BTN and BTN primary that set the color blue. And BTN, BTN secondary, set that element as a button with the secondary style, so gray. gray. And BTN success, green, etc. Mm -hmm. So, and again, all, everything is written here. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of examples, a lot of content. Uh, but again, the, the most important, the, the clear way to, to understand this is actually trying to do things and read a little bit of documentation and try to do things. Because it's actually getting what they put on the page, understand it, and use it in your code. And change the small things you can change. And adapt the things you can adapt. Uh, the real change, and then there are other things like cards, for instance, if you want to use cards. And there are also um, accordion that in the example CR works. So you can see how it works. Or modal, for instance. Modals use a lot of IDs. So if you use multiple modals in one page, pay attention to the IDs. And so this is a modal, and you can also see how it works, a modal. In this case, by clicking a button and then closing it. And support everything that you need, basically. And then you can personalize. You don't like the color, you can change it. You don't like this, the font style, you can change it, just overwrite it. Uh, but the main things to, to keep in mind for Bootstrap is that how we structure the page. Um, Bootstrap structure the page in columns. That I don't find anymore, where it is. It's, it's responsible, it's responsive by default. Um, so if, if you apply the elements, you will get um, everything. Where are we? There was a nice picture once upon a time. Anyway, um, Bootstrap set the space, I will tell you by voice. Set, yeah? CSS grid? No, no, CSS grid is the grid in CSS. That is not the same thing. Uh, because Bootstrap uses flex, typically. Normally, it is called the grid system, but use flex. And the CSS grid is the version with the grid. And so Bootstrap is define the page in 12 columns. Mm? So the page width is 12 columns. It's written somewhere. It's 12 columns. And you can decide if an element is on one column, is on four columns, is on 12 columns, and any subset of that. Mm? So you can say that in your page, you will have two columns, six and six. 
that will be the 50 percent of the page will be one column and the other 50 percent of the page will be the other column and then within this 50 percent you can add the elements and they will behave like block based element but they will stay within the 50 percent of the page so if you want two columns on a side and a main you can have a column uh, three and the other side column nine because nine plus three is twelve so the total should be always 12 and if you want to just use 12 you can just write call 12 or call and it will use all the available space and so if within a specific area you want to split another columns you can do that you can have a column six and within the column six you still have 12 columns in a small space so another column column six is 25 percent of the entire page so you can structure that in columns and the other concept is that every columns uh, should be in a row hmm? so let me copy this so we can try to add bootstrap so the first things to add bootstrap is to add bootstrap add the css of bootstrap um, and here there is an example but what we need to to add is uh, we need to add some meta content in the in the head hmm, that specify the viewport mainly because this is responsive so it needs to specify which is the default viewport and which is the initial zoom for the rest of the operation and then we need to add the bootstrap css file that is exactly a link like our previous style sheet it's just longer it's longer because the href is longer it's not a file in our computer and it's longer because it has this integrity to check if the css file is valid or is malevolous and then you also need to add a javascript file it's not mandatory but you can also add a javascript file for you know the modal modal opens by clicking a button without reloading the page that is javascript in action so behavior some behaviors are fixed uh, are hidden in bootstrap but they are implemented in javascript and so we can go in the end of the body after the footer and we can write we can copy this script that is a javascript file and if we save this so we didn't change anything in html just uh, i just removed the the style and if we open this you will see that already if you remember how they were before something changed like the title the font size the fonts changing yes Where should I put the in the end at the end of the body like the last things within the body After within. within the body yes for now we will move it next week okay so this is just applying job bootstrap to the page And then we can say, okay, I want this as a navbar because we wanted a navbar. So as I said before, we can go in the navbar. We can pick the version we like. That could be this one, for instance. So actually we don't need any link, so we can just pick this one. Uh, this is only partial okay let's pick the default one and then we will change the things that we don't need so let's copy all of these and here in the header we can paste all that thing and we can see the result
and you see that there is a nav bar that is responsive and then with a small screen there is also the button to open the other options this is by default and if you increase the screen you see that the elements appear so here instead of nav bar we should write here we should write uh, heap overflow overrun and uh, we don't need anything else we can keep the home link and everything else can be removed hmm? so we can keep the home link just in case and we can remove this form this is for the uh, video the, the, the search and we can that's it h1 and you see that now the navbar is just this and the home and then if you reduce the screen it's opening just for the home that's the responsive version because we kept that so let's have a look at this, how it's doing. So the nav bar is made of an element it's called nav, that's an HTML standard element for navigation. And then it has four classes. Uh, the first is saying the nav bar. It's the general classes for the nav bar. The second one is uh, the fact that the nav bar is expanded in large, so with a large resolution, and then it needs to be contracted otherwise. And BG light is the type of color of the background. BG stands for background. Again, all of this is written in the documentation. And so we can say, for instance, that this background dark. And if we do background dark, it becomes dark. Hmm? Uh, and then clearly the text is not readable anymore. So we need to add another class to make the background, um, the text visible. Hmm? And bootstrap. here as in the end of this show you the other kind of, of nav bar we can have so for instance if you want the blue one we can say the nav bar is we can add we need to add a class that is nav bar dark and the background becomes primary because it's blue and if we refresh that it becomes blue and and white the the element mm -hmm. what this does what does this uh, after it defines a div containing all these elements um, And then it has a certain point, a button here, that is this button here for collapsing and showing the navbar. This button appears through a media query only when the screen resolution is smaller than a certain amount. And it's this button here that is not visible. And then after this button, it tells you what should appear in the opened part of the button. It should appear just the home page. So without the button, the home page is listed there. And when it's not collapsed, when the navbar is collapsed, sorry, when the navbar is collapsed, then you should see in a list, UL stands for unordered um, list, and LE stands for list item, the elements of the navbar. In this case, we just have one. When we are in a not collapsed area so we are bigger screen then the number is fully visible and the button is hidden and this home here is just visible uh, outside of this so at a certain point we so we go over a certain media query a media query disabled it and we see the home page again the home link again and this is the navbar so let's remove the side um, 
we can then set up the um, the layout of the else, everything else. So in Bootstrap, most most is done through classes. Um, we need to define three elements in Bootstrap: the container, the row, and the columns in this order. A, um, a row should be in, inside a container, and a column should be inside a row. You can use it without the others, but they misbehave if they are not put in this order. So the first things since we want to have all this with a layout, is to define a container. Use the class container. And we can then have um, all of these within a row, for instance. So we can have a div here with class row and move all the questions within the row. So a row is a single element, a semantically single element of space horizontally. So things that are connected together, it can be together. So the question with the text, with the author, makes sense to be in the same row, in the same area, horizontal area, that is different from the table. So we can have a row, and then we can say that uh, for instance, the questions is um, class call minus 6, that means out of 12, 6, 50% of the page. And we can move this asked by before, and we can say that this is a call class call 6 again. Uh, for instance, and then we need to close here the div because we have ended the space, actually. And so this, the question will be outside of the div in this moment. But let's see what happens now to these two elements. So first of all, setting a container moved everything in the middle of the screen. Mostly. Give a margin. And then see what happened with call 6. That these two elements, okay, with zoom, the behavior is not always correct, but I'm zooming for readability. Uh, hmm? You see that this is, if you do an inspect element, you see that this is occupy all the space because still a block element, so occupy all the available space. But question one just occupy 50% of the available space. And after that, we have the other paragraph. So we created two columns in this moment to put these questions these two elements that should go one after the other, one after the other, but horizontally, not vertically. And, and we can do the same with other things. So we can say that the, um, this other row, the question is column 12. So we can define another row and another column 12. And then we can say that the table, well, the table is, is a, it has its own style. So we can apply the style of the table. It will be in another row with, again, column 12, because maybe the, call, the table should occupy all the space. Or if we want a smaller table, we can reduce the table. And similarly, we can do the same for the footer that currently is in the border because we apply the container only to the main. We didn't apply the container to the footer that was outside the main. So also there we need a new container. Um, so container, we had a row, we can add another row here, we can add another row here, and then in the footer we need to add a container, a row, and a column. Always these three things together. And then if you want, we can, for instance, um, since we are towards the end of the lecture, we can, for instance, change the buttons. 
so the buttons, for instance, can have um, if we look here, the buttons will have a class or oh, another class. Well, we can skip looking. We can have a class that is called BTN, that stands for button, and then if we want to put it the which color? Info. Hmm? BTN, BTN info, BTN stage is a button. Apply the class of button, BTN info decide the colors for the, the button, and BTN info is this sort of blue hmm? color and see it change also the size it change the uh, the border it change everything hmm? so if you want to apply this and there is btn info that is one warning that is yellow danger this is red success is green secondary that is gray and then there are the inline version of this so with the border color red but not the content color red so a, a lot of flexibility so if we do the same here for the others they will all look the same. And for the add instead, we can use instead of info, success. That is the green one. And, and you see, but, but this is mostly applying bootstrap to uh, HTML page you have. Adding the classes, the right classes in the right place. Adding some divs to contain the elements. Um, semantically contain the elements, etc. Mm? And, and you can obtain, and I can upload this online, you can obtain applying bootstrap to that page, something like this, if you want. Mm? So it's still the same HTML we developed together. It's just with other classes from bootstrap. So the table has a background color, the footer is on the back, of the page, always on the back of the page, with position, etc. And the author is in these peels, they have peels, so you can change the color of the peels with the same color of the buttons, so always the same three, four colors, etc. So you can, applying bootstrap means again, starting from an HTML page and then adding things, adding classes, adding divs mostly, or in this case for the navbar, adding elements that is the navbar that we were missing uh, semantic elements that was the navbar to add uh, more things to what we want to to do okay so we're going to use bootstrap for all, all over the course we will see again how to use it especially with the react we will see different way to use it because we will have components uh, but on Thursday, the lab will just be on HTML, CSS, and Bootstrap. So mostly creating a web page for your movies that you started last time with the database, just an HTML page for your movies with a table probably similar to this, and adding Bootstrap to that. So you can experiment with Bootstrap. Again, it's not um, complex to understand. There are really few things to understand. The grids... 16 grids, 16 columns, and then there is the fact that you have a container with a row, with a column within, and there are very few things to remember. Most of the other things is reading the documentation and understanding how to, uh, which classes you want to use to obtain your results. And all the other complications that you will encounter will be instead related to CSS in general because Bootstrap uses CSS. So if you didn't know about CSS, and you didn't read about the readings, you didn't read the readings, read the reading before Thursday or while you are in the lab because they can help you also to understand some uh, issues with CSS. And as always, if you have any questions, I'm still here for 10 minutes uh, or you can write via email or via Telegram. Okay? So see you next week and... On Thursday, you will go in the lab with Luca. <laughs>